and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we will continue our reading of Over the Gate by Miss Reed. Miss Reed is the school teacher in the small English village of Fairacre, where it is Christmas time. The sleet was cruelly painful on our faces as we scuttled across the churchyard to St. Patrick's. Inside it was cold and shadowy. The marble memorial tablets on the wall glimmered faintly in the gloom, and the air struck chill. But the crib was aglow with rosy light, a spot of warmth and hope in the darkness. The children tiptoed towards it, awed by their surroundings. They spent a long time gazing, whispering their admiration, and pointing out particular details to each other. They were loath to leave it, and the shelter of the great church, which had defied worse weather than this for many centuries. We pelted back to the school, for I had a secret plan to put into action, and three o'clock was the time appointed for it. St. Patrick's clock chimed a quarter two above our heads as we hurried across the churchyard. I had arranged with the infant's teacher to go privately into the lobby promptly at three, and there shake some bells abstracted earlier from the percussion band box. We hoped that the infants would believe that an invisible Father Christmas had driven by on his sleigh and delivered the two sacks of parcels which would be found in the lobby. At the moment, these were in the hall of my house. I proposed to leave my class for a minute, shake the bells, hide them from inquisitive eyes, and return again to the children. This innocent deception could not hope to take in many of my own children, I felt sure, but the babies would enjoy it, and so too would the younger ones in my classroom. I was always surprised at the remarkable reticence which the older children showed when the subject of Father Christmas cropped up. Those that knew seemed more than willing to keep up the pretense for the sake of the younger ones, and perhaps because they feared that the presents would not be forthcoming if they let the cat out of the bag or boasted of their knowledge. I settled the class with more paper. They could draw a picture of the crib, or St. Patrick's Church, or a winter scene of any kind, I told them. Someone wanted to go on with his list of presents and was readily given permission. The main thing was to have a very quiet classroom at three o'clock. Our Gothic doors are of sturdy oak, and the sleigh bells would have to be shaken to a frenzy in order to make themselves heard. At two minutes to three by the wall clock, Patrick looked up from drawing a church with all four sides showing at once, and surmounted by what looked like a mammoth ostrich. I've got muck on my hand, he said. Can I go out to the lobby and wash? Maddening child, what a moment to choose. Not now, I said as calmly as I could. Just wipe it on your hanky. He produced a dark gray rag from his pocket and rubbed the offending hand, sighing in a martyred way. He was one of the younger children, and I wondered if he might possibly half believe in the sleigh bells. I'm just going across to the house, I told them, squaring my conscience, but be very quiet while I'm away. The infants are listening to a story. All went according to plan. I struggled back through the sleet with the two sacks, deposited one outside the infant's door into the lobby and the other outside our own. The lobby was as quiet as the grave. I withdrew the bells from behind a stack of bars of yellow soap, which Mrs. Pringle stores on a lofty shelf, and crept to the outside door to begin shaking. Santa Claus in the distance and fast approaching, I told myself. Would they be heard, I wondered, waggling frantically in the open doorway? I closed the door gently against the driving sleet and now shook with all my might by the two inner doors. Heaven help me if one of the children burst out to see what was happening. There was an uncanny silence from inside both rooms. I gave a last magnificent agitation and then crept along the lobby to the soap and tucked the bells securely out of sight. Then I returned briskly to the classroom. You could have heard a pin drop. There was bells outside, said Joseph huskily. The clock's just struck three, I pointed out, busying myself at the blackboard. No, little bells, said someone. At this point, the dividing door between the infant's room and ours burst open to reveal a bright-eyed mob lugging a sack. Father Christmas has been! We heard him! We heard bells, didn't we? That's right, sleigh bells! 
Ernest, by this time, had opened our door into the lobby and was returning with the sack. A cheer went up and the whole class converged upon him. Into your desks, I bellowed, and Ernest can give them out. Ernest upended the sack and spilt the contents into a glorious heap of pink and blue parcels as the children scampered to their desks and hung over them, squeaking with excitement. The babies sat on the floor, receiving their presents with awed delight. There was no doubt about it. For them, Father Christmas was as real as ever. I became conscious of Patrick's gaze upon me. Did you see him? he asked. Not a sign, I said truthfully. Patrick's brow was furrowed with perplexity. If you'd let me wash my hand, I reckon I'd just about have seen him, he said at length. I made no reply. Patrick's gaze remained fixed on my face, and then a slow, lovely smile curved his countenance. Together, amidst the hubbub of parcel opening around us, we shared the unspoken, immortal secret of Christmas. Later, with the presents unwrapped and the floor a sea of paper, Mrs. Pringle arrived to start cleaning up. Her face expressed considerable disapproval, and her limp was very severe. The children thronged around her, showing their toys. Ain't mine lovely? Look, it's a dust cart. This is a magic painting book. It says so. Mrs. Pringle unbent a little amid so much happiness and gave a cramped smile. Ernest raised his voice as she limped her way slowly across the room. Mrs. Pringle! Mrs. Pringle! The lady turned, a massive figure ankle-deep in pink and blue wrappings. What do you want in your stocking, Mrs. Pringle? called Ernest. There was a sudden hush. Mrs. Pringle became herself again. And my stocking, she asked tartly, a new leg, that's what I want. She moved majestically into the lobby, pretending to ignore the laughter of the children at this sally. As usual, I thought wryly, Mrs. Pringle had had the last word. Chapter 4 Mrs. Next Door One of the most exhilarating things about the holidays is the freedom to wander about the village at those hours which are, in term time, spent incarcerated in the classroom. There is nothing I relish more than calling at the post office or the village shop in the mid-afternoon or morning, like all my lucky neighbors who are not confined by school hours. A few days before term began, I set off to buy stamps from Mr. Lamb, our postmaster. It was a sharp, sunny January morning, with thin ice crackling on the puddles and distant sounds that could be heard exceptionally clearly. A winter robin piped from a high, bare elm. Cows lowed three fields away, and somewhere high above, an airliner whined its way to a warmer land than ours. Nearer at hand, I could hear a rhythmic chugging sound. As I turned toward the post office, I saw that it came from a cement mixer hard at work in front of a pair of cottages which were being made into one attractive house. A group of my school children hovered nearby, gazing at the operations. Some trailed shopping bags, and I could only hope that their mothers were not in urgent need of anything, for it was obvious that the fascination of men at work was overpowering. Patrick was among them, gyrating like a dervish as an enormous scruffy dog on a lead tugged him round and round. Hello, miss. He managed to puff on his giddy journey, and the others smiled and said hello in an abstracted fashion. The workmen seemed to be getting far more concentrated attention than is my usual lot, I noticed. As I waited my turn to be served, I looked through the window at the scene. I had ample time to watch, for this was Thursday, Pensions Day, and several elderly Fairacre worthies were collecting their money. Mr. Lamb had a leisurely chat with each one, and as we all had a word with each other as well, it was a very pleasant and sociable twenty minutes, and we all felt the better for it. The cottages had been stripped of their old rotting thatch, and the men were busy making a roof of cedar shingles. Watching them run up and down ladders, I suddenly remembered that it was one of these cottages in which Mrs. Next Door had lived. Miss Clare had told me her story soon after I arrived as schoolmistress at Fairacre School. 
It happened to be the first time I had visited Miss Clare's cottage at the neighboring village of Beach Green. She had lived there since she was six years old. When I first met her, she was in charge of the infants' class at Fairacre, a wise, patient, white-haired teacher who had taught there for half a century. It was gloriously hot August afternoon when I set out to walk to Miss Clare's, and I very soon found that it was much further than I realized. I toiled up a short, steep hill and leaned thankfully upon a field gate near the summit. Cornfields spread before me, shimmering in the heat. Scarlet poppies dropped a petal or two, and high in the blue a hawk hovered motionless for a while, and then painted invisible circles with its wingtip, slipping languidly and elegantly round the sky. I resumed my travels, but determined to catch the bus home. Luckily, it was market day, and a bus would leave Caxley just before six o'clock, passing Miss Clare's cottage about half past. After one of Miss Clare's sumptuous teas and a great deal of chatter, we walked together to her white gate. Two hawthorn trees flanked it and have met above to form a thick archway. In its welcome shade, we waited, she on her side of the gate and I on the other, ready to dart to the edge of the road when the bus came in sight. An old lady, very upright on an ancient bicycle, pedaled slowly past and wished us good morning. When she was out of earshot, Miss Clare said, That's Mrs. Next Door. At least, she's really Mrs. Wood and my nearest neighbor, but I think of her as Mrs. Next Door. She began to laugh and then noticed my puzzled air. Oh, of course, I forgot. You don't know the story of Polly, who was the original Mrs. Next Door. It happened years ago in Fairager and was as good as any serial story to us in the village. She leaned comfortably upon her gate in the shade of the leafy archway and embarked on a gay snippet of Fairacre's history. A few years after the Great War of 1914-18, to when Fairacre was doing its best to settle down again to peaceful village affairs, Two young couples moved into the pair of thatched cottages opposite the post office within a few weeks of each other. The first pair were named Leslie and Bertha Foster. They were both big, fair, and rather slow, with one boy, Billy, who was almost five years old. When they arrived soon after Michaelmas Day, Bertha was again in an interesting condition, or it might be more correct to say in a condition interesting to the village. Fairacre speculated upon the possible date of the unknown's arrival, its sex, and the many vicissitudes it would cause its mother before and during birth. Leslie Foster was the newly appointed cowman to Walnut Tree Farm, and as he had an aunt in Fairacre, his history was fairly well known. But his wife was a Caxley girl, and the village watched closely to see how she would settle down. On the whole, she was approved. She was friendly and hard-working, by the evening of the first day, her house was clean and tidy and new curtains hung at the windows. To be sure, Fairacre was not at all certain about the curtains. Most people had lace ones, a few rose to flowered cretonne, and the gentry seemed to go in for damask or velvet as they had done for years. But Bertha's curtains were of plain cream cotton, and she had stitched five rows of colored braid along the bottom. The braid was a deep blue, exactly the same color as the one cushion in the room, which was placed squarely upon the seat of Leslie's wooden armchair. Some thought the curtains were a bit far-fetched and arty-crafty, but one or two younger people thought them real pretty and up-to-date. A few weeks later, the second cottage became occupied. Mike Norton was also going to work for the same employer as his neighbor, for these were tied cottages. They had not moved in earlier because a faulty chimney had needed attention. His wife, Polly, was thin and dark. It was noticed by keen eyes around them that their house was not put in order as quickly as the Fosters had been, and that Polly's curtains were extremely shabby and obviously makeshift. There were no children, but many a wife told another that Polly Norton looked a bit peaky, and as they had been married now for six months, so they had heard, Perhaps she had good cause. The two families became friends. The men did not have the same opportunity to exchange confidences, obstetric and otherwise, which their wives had, for they only saw each other briefly on the farm, and both were glad to rest indoors when they reached home in the evening. 
but the two women spent a great deal of time in each other's houses and often took Billy for a walk in the afternoon together. Within a fortnight, Bertha had told Polly that her second was due in January and that she wanted a girl, and Polly had coyly mentioned her hopes for the following June. She had set her heart on a boy and was already trying to decide between the names Mervyn and Clifford. Bertha's girl was to be called Maria, after Leslie's mother, and Polly secretly thought it a very common name indeed. Thus began a halcyon period of exchanging knitting patterns, comparing the discomforts of early and advanced pregnancy, and shopping frugally and caxly for all those things incidental to a new baby's arrival. Despite Bertha's slowness, her greater experience and her upbringing made her the leader of the two. She had been brought up in a respectable home in Caxley, had been taught well at one of the town's schools, and enjoyed the advantage of a mother who was an excellent cook and dressmaker. Bertha's few shillings went a good deal further than Polly's. Polly was one of a large and somewhat feckless family from Beach Green, this was her first home, and she was anxious to make it as splendid as she could without taking too much time and trouble in doing so. As soon as Mike brought home his first week's wages, she clamored for money for new curtains. Can't be done this week, said her husband ruefully. You'll have to put a bit by regular. Polly saw the sense in this and reckoned that she should have enough to buy the material before Christmas. She discussed the matter eagerly with Bertha, and this was her neighbor's first shock. "'If you don't mind,' said Polly brightly, "'I'd like them just exactly like yarn.' Bertha was seriously taken aback. "'Well,' she began doubtfully in her slow voice, "'I don't truthfully know, as Polly cut in swiftly. "'I reckon they're the prettiest curtains I've ever seen, "'and another thing, the two houses would look much nicer "'with matching curtains in front.' Dales had some real nice cream material in their last sale last week, and I can get the braid there, too. It was quite apparent to Bertha that the matter was as good as settled. Nettled though she was, she did not protest. After all, there was really nothing to stop Polly from having similar curtains, she told herself, and for the sake of the coming baby, she tried not to feel upset. But for the rest of the day, resentment smoldered in Bertha's breast. When Leslie came home, she poured the tale into his ears. Leslie, cold, tired, and busy with his rabbit stew, did his best to smooth things over. I shouldn't fret about it. Don't hurt you if the curtains are the same. My ma says imitation is the best form of flattery. Come to think of it, Bertha, it's a compliment, really. Shows she likes your choice. Bertha was somewhat mollified by this aspect of the matter. In any case, she did not want to fall out with her neighbor, and nothing more was said. Nevertheless, the incident rankled, and when the curtains were hung at last, she felt crosser than ever when she saw that the braid was the identical width and color and arranged in exactly the same five rows. "'Should have thought she could have had red or green or summit different,' exclaimed Bertha to her husband. "'I should be ashamed to be such a copycat.' Bertha's placid countenance was quite pink with wrath, and Leslie again had to act as a soothing agent. The baby was now due, and whether the curtains next door had anything to do with it, the arrival of a fine daughter that night, no one could tell. The birth was easy, and Leslie was able to set off to work at his usual time, leaving Bertha and Maria in the capable hands of the local midwife. "'Ain't she just lovely?' breathed Polly admiringly when she came round to see the baby. Her sharp eyes fell upon the cradle. It had been dressed in yard upon yard of spotted muslin by Bertha's mother and caught at the top with a splendid pink satin bow. "'You never showed me the cradle,' she said reproachfully. Bertha, sleepy and content, smiled upon her. "'It was at my ma's. She only brought it over yesterday.' What's more, she made two bows, one pink and one blue, so we'd have the right one. Polly was full of admiration. United in baby worship, the two neighbors were in happy accord. But this blissful state of affairs was not to last long. Spring arrived, and a double row of purple crocuses bordered Bertha's path. Behind them stood a fine row of polyanthuses, heavy with buds. 
In Polly's identical border, there were also purple crocuses, and behind hers grew an equally fine collection of polyanthus plants. It's too bad, exclaimed Bertha to Leslie, thoroughly vexed. She knew I'd put them in, and I wouldn't mind betting her spring flowers come out yellow, same as arm. They did, and Bertha's wrath grew. The tart comments which hovered on her tongue she managed to restrain, however, although she wondered at times if a bit of plain speaking would be a good thing. Her baby was now a few months old, a big, fair, placid child like her parents. Billy had started school, and Bertha was free to attend to her neighbor when she felt the onset of birth pangs. Polly was unduly fearful, clinging to Bertha in much agitation. Don't he leave me till Mrs. Drew comes, she begged, naming the local midwife. Don't fret, answered Bertha soothingly. I'll stay with you, but I think you'd be better upstairs. No, no, responded Polly. I'll walk about down here and get Mike's dinner ready atween whiles. Keeps my mind off it a bit to have something to do. Bertha saw the sense in this and did not press the matter. She was greatly relieved, though, when the midwife came and hustled her patient upstairs. The baby was a long time arriving. Bertha and Leslie could hear muffled activity in the bedroom next door to their own. I do feel downright sorry for Polly, murmured Bertha, the memory of her own experiences still fresh in her mind. It must be over soon, that's one comfort. But the baby had not arrived when the Fosters rose next morning. Mike came round, haggard and unshaven, to ask Leslie to take a message to the farm. She's about all in, he said. By George, that's the last baby we're having. Never thought it'd be such a set to. Bertha and Leslie made light of it, teasing him, but he was too tired to appreciate badinage and returned moodily to his home. At midday, the child was born. The midwife called in to tell Bertha it was a girl. They're both asleep and can do with it, declared the old woman who had brought half Fairacre into the world. I'll look in tomorrow, promised Bertha when she's feeling better. The next morning, a posy in her hand for Polly and a freshly made pie for Mike's supper in her basket, Bertha went next door. She called, but there was no reply. She mounted the stairs and gently pushed open the bedroom door. What Bertha saw, before the opening had widened enough to include the view of mother and child, made her grip the posy in a furiously clenched fist. For there, beside the bed, stood a cradle which was the replica of her own, even to a splendid pink satin bow. Bertha swallowed her rage and tiptoed into the bedroom. The creaking of the old boards awakened Polly. Oh, Bertha, she said with such affection and relief that Bertha's anger melted, tis lovely to see you. Take a peep at the baby. Fancy me having a girl just like you. Bertha could have said that it caused her no surprise, but this was hardly the time to be so uncharitable. In any case, the newborn infant quite won her heart with its red puckered face, cobwebby black hair, and skinny fingers. Ain't she a real beauty, she exclaimed with sincerity. A thought struck her. What are you going to call her? Mildred, replied the mother. It begins with M, just like yarn. Bertha was thankful that the child was not to be another Maria, and turning her eyes from the ribbons and flounces of the hated cradle, she settled the posy in water, made Polly some tea, reiterated her congratulations, and returned next door. Billy arrived home from school and was told the news. He took it stolidly. Babies did not mean much to Billy. If anything, he disapproved of them. They drew attention to themselves, he knew, to the detriment of their older brother's welfare. But he brightened at the thought of telling Miss Clare, his teacher, all about it when he went to school next morning. Miss Clare was as impressed with the news as he had hoped she would be. But Billy's eyes did not miss the flicker of amusement which crossed her kind face when he said, And it's a girl just like Arne. At playtime, Miss Clare told the news to Mr. Benson, the headmaster. In common with the rest of Fairacre, he had watched the doings in the pair of cottages with amusement and considerable sympathy for the much-tried Bertha Foster. Isn't that typical, he commented. Poor Mrs. Foster, 
I wonder what Polly will call it. Maria, no doubt, and it will have an identical pram. The village hummed with the news. Give Polly her due, said one fair-minded neighbor. She couldn't help it being a girl, now could she? She could help her curtains and the flowers in front, and this here new cradle she's got, answered a less charitable listener. Bertha must be a proper angel to stay friends with a copycat like Polly. Well, we'll see how much the angel can put up with next time.